And I think it's very much what is essential about Martha Graham is that Martha, like so many of her peers uh, in the kind of the invention of modern dance, was trying to discover a metaphorical space on stage that mirrored real life, that mirrored reality, that mirrored human experience. What struck me most about this thing called modern dance was that as I was dancing these works by William Hugg and as I watched on video dances by Martha Graham or Jose Limon, I was struck by the humanism, by the fact that these, these dances were about real people. They were not stor uh, fairy tales. Um, that these choreographers, choreographers were, were aiming to express something about the human condition that um, that was, that was real, and they were dancing in bare feet. And many times there weren't a lot of elaborate sets and things, that the stages were rather bare. And I began to realize that there was a kind of a brotherhood or sisterhood, a community of modern dancers, that these people considered themselves pioneers of sorts. And as I learned more about modern dance, I realized that indeed, Modern dance, and this might be one of the first things on this outline I put together, modern dance, in a sense, is one of the few indigenous art forms in this country, along with jazz, some say tap dance, I'm sure there are others. But um, most of what we now consider modern dance came out of a time in the 20s and 30s, in New York City mostly, but some on the West Coast a little later. The early modern dancers, <coughs> did their first performances in uh, union halls and or the 92nd Street, the, the United States Street, 92nd Street YMCA. Uh, they were supported by uh, Jewish causes. They were supported by union socialist causes. Uh, a lot of the early modern dancers actually became parts of movements where they would do mass dances <coughs> for rallies. So what I'm saying is that modern dance wanted to be connected to the people. And I think that made it very American. Uh, I need to go back a little bit to give you a history of where Martha came from. Um, <coughs> Martha was born in Pittsburgh in 1894. Her father was a doctor uh, who was a progressive thinking man. Uh, he was probably one of the first to kind of consider medicine or the treating of people in terms of uh, behavior. Of, um, uh, and so one of the first things Martha remembers is uh, trying to get away with something on the sly. And her father kind of looking down at her and saying, Martha, you know, I can read everything about this little deception you're trying to play on me. Movement never lies. And Martha would remind us all constantly about this quote from her father, movement never lies, i.e. the body language says something without our opening our mouths that reveals something about our condition, about the state of our minds, our emotions. And uh, Martha's family moved from very sooty Pittsburgh. It was at a time when there were no uh, laws against pollution and of course, a lot of coal action going on in steel in Pittsburgh. Um, I actually, when I was last in Pittsburgh, tracked down the street that Martha was born on. And it's now very, uh, it, I'd say it's close to a kind of an inner city urban slum area. But, uh, so it was kind of sad to see the remnants of these townhouses, which in the late 1800s were probably very lovely homes. Um, which, it, and that's typical of any American city. Um, when Martha was about, was in her teens, her father, uh, I think it was for, the, for his health or his wife's health, moved the family to Santa Barbara, California. And Martha remembers the train <coughs> ride. She also remembers the extraordinary weather when she hit California and the light. She talked about the light of California and how profoundly that influenced her. Uh, as a kid from the, the East Coast, from Pittsburgh, the spaces of traveling across the country and witnessing for the first time the vastness of the United States. 
Um, and again, we're thinking now in about, this must have been about what, 2008? I'm sorry, what, uh, 1908? Um, they made it to Santa Barbara. Um, Martha studied some music, but she came infatuated with uh, dance when she saw Ruth St. Dennis perform. Ruth St. Dennis is, along with Isadora Duncan, is kind of considered one of the of two great mamas of modern dance. Ruth St. Dennis and her partner Ted Sean had a company called Dennis Sean. And Ruth was a very exotic woman and she, she had a school. She insisted that her students learn yoga, ballet, and her version of a kind of a flowing movement vocabulary. She put together performances that uh, reconstructed or recreated various ethnic styles. She'd have the Burmese dance, she'd have the Egyptian dance, she'd have the this dance and the that. And um, as best she knew how, she would try to recreate. She actually traveled uh, to, to many foreign countries to do her research. This was before there were anthropologists doing dance research with video cameras and all. So, and she would teach, she would have her company and Martha uh, was allowed into the school, although she was considered a rather ugly runt. She was short and not very pretty. Um, she had this big jaw, and she was rather short, um, but she quickly proved herself to, uh, as a very theatrical being, where she could light up the stage. And when Ted Sean, who did most of the male lead roles, was without a partner for one tour, he asked Martha to be his partner, and that was the beginning. Martha got bitten by the bug, she, she was under the lights, and she, chew, as they say, she chewed up the scenery. She had this inner kind of whiplash, fierce animal dynamic that, um, that was unique in, in, that, in the company at the time. Uh, so Martha really grew to, uh, love the theater uh, and the kind of the exoticism that, that dance offered. Um, but she wearied of it and she teamed up with the then musical director, and I will show you some excerpts of dances with music by Louis Horst, H-O-R-S-T. Louis Horst is important in that he's really the first American modern composer who worked very closely with an American choreographer to custom tailor and to to create scores specifically for the dances. And this is something that now we just take for granted. A uh, hundred years later, I have, I've commissioned so many composers to make scores for my dances. It was largely because Louis Horst did the exact same thing for Martha Graham a hundred years ago. Okay. Uh, Louis, well, I'd say 90 years ago. Uh, uh, Louis, Martha left California and came to New York. And uh, she got a job in the Greenwich Follies as the art act. She was the kind of the aesthetic <coughs> art act among all of these strippers and stuff. It's pretty uh, crazy. And uh, but the the boss of the of the Follies really treated her well and paid her more than the others because she was the the artsy act. She had class. And uh, if you. You could see images of Martha in these early dances. And they, they had a direct connection to the dances she did with Dennis Sean. They were often very exotic, um, with her face painted, and uh, oftentimes with a, a, an Asian or a Spanish flavor to them. Uh, Louis Horst followed her to New York a few years later, and he convinced Martha that she should start forging out on her own to make her own signature movement style. He introduced to Martha the, the contemporary music of the time, Henry Cowell, uh, other composers who were, who were forging new sounds in music and trying to find an American music sound. Uh, so by uh, 1929, Martha had forged her own company of all women, and Louis Horst began to make uh, music for her. And I want to show you some clips here. The first clip is, uh, again, basically, and this will inform our talks about the collaboration between Copeland and Graham when we get there. 
But what you'll see here is the way Horst made music that was custom tailored to the structure of the dance. In the first excerpt from Graham's most, probably her most famous solo, her signature solo, uh, it's a work called Lamentation. Some of you have may, may have seen it. It's been parodied a lot because it's easy to parody. It's kind of silly. I mean, I could see it on Saturday Night Live as a parody. But Martha got the idea of stitching together a, a piece, a large piece of stretch jersey fabric, and she made a tube out of it. She put herself into it. She sat on a low bed, and she began to experiment with ways of pulling her body inside this tube of stretch jersey in as many ways as possible. And what she was discovering were two things. One, the ability to shape the body into an abstract shape, similar to what Miro, Picasso, Brock, um, Brancusi were doing in the visual arts. She was actually using her body to forge abstract art. Secondly, she was feeling in her own body what it means to pull the muscle and the bone to at least two points of through, through points of opposition to create a tension in the body which reads emotion. In this case, it was a lamentation. She was lamenting. So what you'll see here is just a clip from the original lamentation of Martha dancing it in the late 20s. And the, the only reason we have this footage is that when she was teaching at the Eastman School in Rochester, she teamed up with people at Eastman Kodak. They wanted to experiment, do the first experiments with color film, so they asked if she would be a subject. So we're going to just watch some clips from um, Martha in that early lamentation. I'm going to see which one. The music is by Zoltan Kodai. This, in this case, the, the, the piano score was written before she choreographed it. But you see that Martha never, this is a, a lecture I just gave in Paris a few weeks ago, Martha never choreographed to the music. She always had music as a, a kind of a sonic backdrop to her visceral rhythms. So just a quick example of early Graham and, and when she was discovering the potential for the body to create emotion. In this case, she was using fabric as a kind of a, um, uh, an extension of her own skin, if you will. Uh, so that was in the 30s. Martha began working with Louis Horst to create more dances, and she began to use groups, uh, choruses or choirs of dancers, where she began to experiment with, a, with contrasting the, the soloist or individual versus the chorus. And if, this goes way back to Greek theater, where the chorus amplifies what the um, solo figure is doing, it, it foreshadows, it comments upon. This is classic Greek chorus stuff. Martha began to use the group and to, she, I, of course, she appointed herself as the soloist to be the individual, the heretic, the outcast. And this too became a classic American form of literature, is the outcast, the individual versus conformity, the individual versus society, etc. So here in this next excerpt, you see, again, Louis Horst's music written specifically for Graham. These are the scores that Louis did for Martha, Heretic, Primitive Mysteries, Frontier, Horizons. These pieces are rarely seen. Uh, but here we've got some really rare footage of Martha and Heretic. Very simple music. So she different, Horst differentiates the voice of the soloist and the chorus. The chorus moves through silence as well. And then again, the voice of the, of the soloist. Is she buckling under the chorus's the wall of silence? So here you, again, you get a sense of that. In this piece, it's much more animated. And this, this piece has everything to do with Appalachian Spring. This is probably Martha's first hint of what she would end up doing many, many years later. This is a piece called Frontier. And listen to her speak. Girl, in the gray 
very different from anything that is pure, and it's not pure to that level at all. The appetite for space. It's the appetite, appetite for space. Of America. One of the things that is made of size. This is high as the sound goes in here, sorry. But she talks about what we were talking about out, out there in the hall, this, the appetite for space. Here you have Horst score. Again, she stretches. It's a lot about gesture. We're going to be doing some expansive gestures later tonight. These simple hops, repeated patterns. This too, uh, uneven numbers. Uh, not everything isn't blocked on fours and eights and waltzes and allegros in classic music. It's a different sound. Uh, I'll just show you. Uh, so from here, Martha uh, formed a company. She brought her first men into the company. It was a very shocking moment. A lot of the, the women in Martha's company remember the time when she brought Eric Hawkins into the company. This was in uh, 39, 40. And it, it really opened up the potential for Martha's thematics in that um, up in 1940, she made a work called Letter to the World, which um, began her uh, kind of an early Americana, but where she borrowed, she was looking for female protagonists who would suit her dramatic needs. And so for Letter to the World, she chose Emily Dickinson, the American poet. And she <coughs> divided up the role of Emily on the stage between herself as the dancer, and uh, at that, that time it was um, Jean Erdman as the speaker, uh, she who speaks. And so you have a double, a doppelganger effect. You have a Martha on stage who speaks the lines of some of the poems. It was a small circle. Jean Erdman was the wife of Joseph Campbell, the philosopher uh, <coughs> who wrote The Hero with a Thousand Faces, etc. So again, Joseph Campbell had a profound influence on Martha as well in terms of creating myths for the stage, whether it be American myths or Greek myths or otherwise, uh, or Jungian or Freudian. Uh, we'll get to that. So Letter to the World came and we saw Martha embodying the Emily Dickinson character. Um, Punch and the Judy was more comic, which is rare for Graham. Land Me Bright had a more Americana thing. Deaths and Entresses, she went to um, Great Britain to English literature and created this rather fierce, violent uh, dance where she had three women depicting the three Bronte sisters and uh, this kind of sibling rivalry over men. And she divided the two male uh, uh, characters between the dark beloved and the romantic beloved. The dark, and I guess that pretty much sums up how Martha considered men. Either they were threatening and erotically charged and something she could fight against, or it was the, it was the more spirited, uh, creative. And guess who played the, um, that spirited, creative beloved? It was Merce Cunningham. Merce Cunningham was the second man to join Martha's company. So this begins the family tree of modern dance and how so much came from Dennis Sean to Martha Graham and on and on. Uh, just moving on, to, and we'll get to Appalachian Springs. Salem Shore was another kind of New England Puritan dance of, of the Salem idea. And then, of course, come 1944, we, get, we come to Appalachian Springs. Uh, so what, what is so special about Appalachian Spring, and why is UMS <coughs> and the company, why are they featuring that for this family matinee that you will come to see? I reckon that it is probably Martha's most famous work. Let me bring the lights up so that if you want to write notes, you can. I'll turn this down when I come to the next little video excerpt. Um, again, it's, it was made largely through the efforts of Eric Hawkins, who became Martha's business manager and who wanted to find ways of funding new work. This was not easy to do during World War II. So he, Eric hooked Martha up with Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge, who was a very wealthy woman, and he convinced her that she should fund three composers to make new scores for Martha's works. So it ended up that with this Coolidge money, 
Martha made Appalachian Spring, um, Herodiad, and Dark Meadow. It was Chavez, it was Copeland, Hindemith, and Chavez. Um, so it was a real boom time for Martha in the, the mid 40s. She was very creative. Um, the Library of Congress now houses all the correspondence between Aaron Copeland and uh, Martha Graham and tells the story of the creation of this wonderful work. Some of it I think you can get online. Uh, but it's a, it's a wonderful story where uh, Martha writes letters, sometimes through the spokesperson for the foundation, but then she becomes more direct with Copeland and they begin an exchange of letters where Martha talks about her ideas for this quintessential American dance, where she wanted to kind of put together in one piece a survey of the, of the American mythology. She, at one point she had John Smith and Pocahontas in it. She had, um, um, <coughs> Who was the vigilante uh, abolitionist? Uh, John Brown. John Brown. Um, and so she was just spouting all of these ideas to Copeland. And gradually, they pared it down to a kind of an essential core. Aaron would send Martha uh, sections of a score that then Martha's pianist would play. Probably Louis Horst would play it for her. And she would listen to it. In the meantime, she would be charting out movement sections Without, with or without the music. Gradually the piece came together almost like a, like a series of puzzle pieces. And the, the, the final version was drastically different from, the, from her original ideas, where she pared the piece down to a core group of lead figures. We have, and this is spelled out on your, um, uh, uh, actually after the coffee break, but uh, I'm gonna change this a little bit. Uh, I want us to do some movement stuff. Before that, I want us to see it. So that rather than going through uh, the, the second part of this and discussing Appalachian Spring before we see it, I think we need to see it first. Because it, the proof of the pudding is what you, to see is to believe, as I already, already say. But just a little more about the creation of this. You have um, the um, figures of the bride, the husband man, the pioneer woman, and the revivalist. Now the revivalist is sometimes called the preacher. And, and then you have a, a chorus of four followers. Um, each of these characters, which we, and we will experiment with this later, has a kind of a characteristic muscle twitch factor. There's a certain way of moving that identifies them. And there are a set, a set of gestures as well. Not that Martha went about systematically choreographing this in the way that we now, how many years later, break down and analyze, but it ended up that this was the way it, that, that it, it evolved. Um, I want to show you, um, before I leave this, I, I, I think I want to continue to give you kind of a, a retrospective of Graham's work uh, before we see Appalachian Spring. The, so you see, her product, productivity between 1940 and 58. From uh, soon after Appalachian Spring, she moves into her Greek period. And this too is an influence of Eric Hawkins, who was a Greek scholar at Harvard. So he got Martha interested in Greek mythology at the same time that Martha was, was seeing a Jungian therapist and dealing with a lot of the subconscious. Um, if you go to the Friday evening performance of the company on the 25th of January, the, that program opens with a video montage that I made, commissioned by the company. Graham's dancing from rare footage from the 40s with excerpts from Hollywood movies at the same time that are all dealing with psychoanalysis. I have images of Betty Davis in Now Voyager, of Olivia de Havilland in The Snake Pit of Gregory Peck and Spellbound, of Orson Welles and The Third Man. You have, you have conversations between female protagonists in the films and their psychoanalysts, or their shrinks, before they were called shrinks. So Martha, in, through Greek mythology, was going 
back into what she called the ancestral memory. And in one such work, which happens to be my favorite work, uh, Night Journey, she flips the story and makes Jocasta the protagonist. If you remember in Sophocles' drama, um, Oedipus is uh, born of Jocasta, but there's a curse, and he's left out on the mountainside to die. Uh, a shepherd finds him, raises him. Oedipus then encounters the Sphinx. He answers the Sphinx's riddle, which then allows him as a reward to marry the queen, who is Jocasta, who is his mother. So talk about Freudian. Uh, you have then in Dark Meta, or I'm sorry, in Eric, uh, Night Journey, you have the, the dance opening with Jocasta about to hang herself because she realizes what has transpired, where she has married her son and has thus fulfilled the curse. And in, in a truly kind of Hitchcockian way, the movie then goes back in time and she relives her memory of all the events that came up to that point, so that at the end of the dance, she finally picks up the rope and hangs herself. So what you're gonna see here, a footage of Graham at age in her late 50s, still dancing in a black and white film, and you'll see the two excerpts. You'll see her first solo, which is her kind of her frantic agony at the discovery of this horror. And then it, it, it then segues into the very last moments of the dance where she kind of, it, it is, it, with a sense of finality and resignation, knows what she has to do. Martha talked a lot about inevitability, where things have to follow an inevitable sequence to their end. And in a way that makes her a bit old fashioned. I don't know how prevalent that idea is of fate or destiny now, but she, she was one of those who, once she was in the groove, had to see it through to the very end. So I'll just show you these two wonderful excerpts that, again, frame who this woman was and the kind of dance drama. This also will then reflect back on Appalachian Spring to show you how very different Appalachian Spring was from the, these Greek dramas. Characteristic visceral rhythm of Graham where she's not dancing on the beat and the score is not easy. It's asymmetrical rhythms. We're going to be talking about contractions in a bit. You see these pulses in the body that are like spasms. She goes on and off the beat, it's, it, which reveals something about her emotional state. And then jumping to the end, this is after, this is at the end where time kind of catches up to itself in the drama. This is the bed that she slept on with her son, unknowing. And this set is by Isamu Noguchi. I also want to talk about the famous sculptor Noguchi for the visual art folks in here. It's really important. Her, she was a, one of the true interdisciplinary artists of her time, and that she was working constantly with set designers, lighting designers, we'll talk about that too. This I don't know if you'd want to show a third grade class, <laughs> but maybe high school. These, this film is available on video. Graham is really of that tradition of high drama, of stage drama. She emulated certain actresses of her time. And the she dancing. makes it look so easy when she goes <laughs> down on that back shoulder. And all of these movements became part of her, the Graham technique. 
And this, believe it or not, is Paul Taylor, the famous American modern dancer, as Tiresias, the seer, the blind seer. That, that's a tradition in, in um, Western theater, the trois coups frappé, the three strikes struck on the floor to begin and end the, the, the piece. So again, Martha was very savvy at traditions of theater as she put these pieces together. Uh, yeah, question? Okay. Uh, yeah, raise your hands and holler out whenever you want to. I can go on and on with this stuff. Those pieces, so was the Schumann piece written before the, before she choreographed it or during, or what was the process of that? You know? I don't know the details of that. Um, I, met, I, I, I would probably bet that Martha gave Schumann the, uh, a script, what we might call a storyboard, in how she wanted to plot this. And, and he put together the score. They were working closely together at the time because I think he was the president of Juilliard at the time and she was teaching there. So they may have had more, more interaction than she and Copeland had because they were in, actually in the same building. Um, here we've got, um, what do we have? Oh, yours truly. Okay, this is a section of Appalachian Spring. I was using this in, for my pr presentation in Paris. This is uh, my performance of the, the preacher, the revivalist, doing his fire and brimstone sermon to chastise and warn the newlyweds of the wages of sin. Here you see a lot of contractions. And we'll see another version of this as well so that you can, you can see how Martha allowed for interpretations of the same role. Gesture. We're going to be all be doing fire and brimstone gestures, curses, or warnings, or a lot of prayer gestures. And when was this found again? This was in uh, '94 when the company was here for the UMS uh, Graham Centenary Festival. This is this is on Power Center stage, actually. You hear this wonderful Copeland score. And the way that Graham choreographs, yes, I'm definitely, I definitely have a rhythmic grid to dance within, but there are moments where I go way off the grid and it becomes the gesture. And then I hit the downbeats at certain points. Those are my markers. strong spine to do Graham. And here's the pioneer woman. We'll be doing gestures of the pioneer woman who blesses the space. Can you say, say more about a rhythmic grid? Um, I know that the Copeland score does dum, bum, bum, dum, dum. So I know that I have to get from little Noguchi rock to a certain point in space and I follow those three points here, and then I have to kind of sum it up to do this thing. And then, uh, yada, and I have this much time to run around here before I open up, and then I have to get the next beat, da 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 da, -da. So there are moments where, I mean, I know where the music is at all times, but I have freedom within the frames to what we used to call boogie boogie, where I can <laughs> rant and flail about and kind of custom tailor it. Would and you, you know, would, yes. would, would you boogie boogie and the grid uh, differently for each performance? Yeah, yeah, we were given the freedom to explore that, almost like a jazz musician. I mean, there was, there were certain areas, and also we tried to be really clever to see how much we could get away with <laughs> before Martha would say, like, pull the reins back in. She rarely did that, though. If we brought integrity and truth to the role, she let us do an awful lot, which is great. Um, the, um, the next excerpt here, okay, this is hardcore. We've made it all the way down on our list to 1958, to the full evening Clytemnestra. And often people call this as Martha's, um, kind of the summation of her greatest works, is that she took 
um, the Oresteia and condensed it into uh, a prologue, two acts, and an epilogue. Here you have Clytemnestra uh, learning that her husband Agamemnon sacrificed their daughter Iphigenia for the winds, for the boats to return them home. Um, plots with Aegisthus, her lover, to pick up the knife, the butcher knife, and slay Agamemnon. And she's summoning that this up in this dance. So Graham really took on the heavies. I, I played Orestes in this, where I end up with the knife and I slay my mother, Clytemnestra. That was always a, a rather primal experience to do. I, I just graduated from Juilliard and had done some Graham work and she invited me to join that new company in 1973. So that's when I came on board. She could no longer dance, so she had to relearn how to choreograph, sitting in her little director's chair, totally arthritic. Her hands were, were permanently like this, her feet were all gnarled up, and she <coughs> would shuffle around. So she had to find ways of investing in a handful of her lead dancers. The kind of inner intensity that she had always been able to generate as the eye of the cyclone on stage. And so she had to uh, figure out a new set, a new template of ways to make dances. So sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. Um, the Scarlet Letter um, <coughs> had a set by the American, uh, actually the South American sculptor Marisol. Uh, with a new score, and <coughs> she went back to Hunter Johnson, who had done some of her first scores in the 40s. Um, Shadows with, was with Manati. What, did, what else did Manati compose? What's the famous? Mall the Night is Horse. He also did a beautiful score for Graham in the 40s to Errand into the Maze. Um, and she was experimenting. Meyer Kupferman, uh, Varez, electronic music. Uh, Samuel Barber, she went back to Barber and she used two arias from the Anthony and Cleopatra opera that Barber did for the Met for Leontine Price. That was a big bomb, but I think they've recently tried to redo it. Uh, Nielsen, that was commissioned by a Scandinavian man who had a lot of money, so she had no choice in that. Well, I, she, had a, she had a choice, and this happens sometimes with commissions, to choose a Scandinavian composer. And so she chose Nielsen. Uh, Barbara again, George Crumb, Stravinsky. She finally got around to doing a Rite of Spring. I don't know how many of you are reading the New York Times or are seeing this flurry of articles now about the 100th anniversary of the premiere of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. It's really big. Uh, Martha attempted it in, in 84, and the company is now reviving it for the first time. They're going to be doing the Rite of Spring. We're not going to be seeing it in Ann Arbor, I don't think. You might have to go to New York to see that. Um, really dynamic. Bar talk for the first time. A beautiful piece. Uh, Stravinsky, again. Um, and then she makes this lovely dance the last year of her life to Scott Joplin. And it opens with a recording of Martha's voice saying, oh, Louis. Play me the maple leaf rag. Mm -hmm. And evidently, this is what she would ask Louis Horst when she was stuck in the studio and didn't know what to do and was really down. She'd ask Louis Horst to, to play the maple leaf rag on the piano. And so that was her la one of her last pieces, uh, which is a, a delightful piece. OK. When, yeah? What, what year did she pass away? Did she passed away in 91. She was born in 94, 1894, and passed away in 1991. Uh, here, to, to end up this chapter, these excerpts, um, I included this in my talk because it shows you how Martha's disciples, and this was done in the 50s, how Martha trained a group of dancers to move with a certain quality, very poetic, very emotional, but very lyrical at the same time and how the body went off this classic uh, balletic grid of the XY axis and was constantly bending and contouring, changing levels. That is significant in modern dance. Not only are they not wearing shoes all the time, but they're 
flowing, they're, they're descending to the floor and rising up again without any effort. And this is what always, that is the sure sign for me of whether someone is a ballet dancer or not a modern dancer, is whether they can go down to the floor and come up again without looking like a klutz. Um, when you say lyrical in descriptions of dance, what are you referring to? Um, well, I would say that percussive would be where the, the accent struck uh, is caught. It's kind of like stop action, maybe. Um, I'd say that lyrical perhaps goes to the other end of the spectrum of what we would call flow, and it, it's continuous. Now, oftentimes it means curvilinear movement instead of angular. It would be hard to do lyrical movement angularly with right angles. So you're, you're talking about flowing movement that is usually curvilinear. And you're, you also have to talk about initiation and the impulse. Lyrical, to me, signifies uh, a certain sentiment or emotion that is about uh, singing, uh, a longing, love. Um, what, what do people sing about? So lyricism, to me, has to do with, with the singing of the body. Does that make sense? Um, and here you have some great examples of two of her foremost disciples, Bertram Ross and Yuriko Kikuchi. This is in a, uh, a film that <coughs> you really should see. It's, it's called A Dancer's World. There is a new double DVD set that has Martha Dancing Appalachian Spring, Martha Dancing Night Journey, and A Dancer's World, where she is talking to the camera as she makes herself up for Jocasta. And it, it freaks kids out because she, they think she's some kind of strange witch, but she's, it's amazing. It's so hyperdramatic. It's a little dated to a lot of people, but I find it absolutely fascinating. She talks about the practice and the art of being a performer and of making dances. And um, it's interspersed with, with how, she talks about how she trains dancers. And it the camera goes into the studio and shows you her cast of younger dancers dancing different excerpts, um, different aspects of love, hate, of torment, etc. And here you have, this is an excerpt from a piece called Canticle, again, song, which is a love duet. What do you have done for the first time? You are able to hold the stage and dance with clarity the deep the deep matters of the heart. To, to dance with clarity, the deep matters of the heart. The, again, the use of change of levels to the floor, falling to the floor. There are a whole set of exercises in gram technique called falls to the floor. Martha loved uh, Asian dancers. There was something about their muscle synapse the, the excitement and the way they could capture a, a, a motion and hold it, that, that just fascinated her. A lot of these, the fellows in her, this company had, had uh, been soldiers in the war, and when they came back from the war, uh, they wanted to dance and came to Martha. It's, it's, it's just a great story of, of American history, the 20th century in a way. She's almost bird-like, the way she moves. Yuriko Kikuchi is still alive, actually. I wish I could be there. She's, she's getting an award. She got an award last night, the Martha Hill Award, for her service to dance, a lifetime of service. Counterbalance. And actually, I'm glad the music is so low, because you can see how the dancers hold their own music in their bodies. Waves, waves of motion. So yeah, I just again, I, I wanted to show you, I, I had these 
excerpts already on a PowerPoint from a few weeks ago, so I thought it would be a good way to kind of give you a retrospective. Um, just a little history about the company, and then we'll take a little stretch break. Um, the company began in the in 2930, and it's so that's the oldest American modern dance company now. Um, it went through some really hard times after Martha passed away. There were three really ugly court battles in the New York courts over who owned Graham's work. And um, it became, th those court cases became case histories in this whole uh, uh, dilemma of who owns choreographic work. Um, what, what ended up happening was that Martha had willed it to her assistant, had willed the works, but there was no legal base for that. She didn't know, she was not informed that in the 50s when she agreed to sign over, to, to form a not-for-profit dance company in school, the Martha Graham Center for Contemporary Dance, that everything she created under that aegis, with the money channeled through that not-for-profit, everything was owned by the foundation, by the, the not-for-profit. So the, the, the judges decided that the company owned her works, which allowed them the company to continue as it is today. So that's just another aspect of... Uh,